Imalkudu not too far from there many years ago as well. So yeah, they'll take that opportunity and bring it down and catch it and eat it. So food is food. But anyway, we're coming to the end of our highlight show for this afternoon. And our plan for the afternoon on this rainy afternoon, I think I'm going to go to the west. I'm going to go work a little bit on the western side of, uh, of Juma. Uh, I'm going to see exactly if we can pick up on anything that's going to be coming across that side. Maybe go look at some of the termite mounds. I think with this little bit of rain that we've had, a very, very, very important thing to do. Maybe they've opened some of the mounds. Maybe get some flying ants coming out. Maybe they're quite busy because now the mounds are a little bit softer. Or oh, get some snakes. You never know. Like a stiletto or some burrowing asps. Uh, asps, 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 or a malt snake. Well, oh, you never know. You never know. Anyway, let's grab your snacks. We're going to grab our snacks. We will see you, see you out on safari. Bye.
afternoon, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the Sunset Safari right here on Wild Earth and a special big uh, welcome to all our kids who are joining us for our Kids Drive. My name is Amy and together with me behind the camera is not Paul. There we go with his little puppet and uh, we are starting off this afternoon with a really pretty bird everyone and it is called a lilac breasted roller now to all the children watching if you have any questions this afternoon please do send them through you can ask an adult or whoever's looking after you to help you do that um, and you can do that through the Wild Earth app on the YouTube channel otherwise um, you can submit them through the website or join the conversation on X using the hashtag Wild Earth. Now it has been a little bit rainy this afternoon uh, but it has lightened up quite a bit. I've actually taken off my rain jacket and we found a little herd of elephants actually when we first arrived here but they've just disappeared into the bushes behind this beautiful lilac breasted roller. Now if you are watching you can look and see all these pretty colors maybe you can try at home to see exactly how many colors you can find on this bird at this moment i think i can count the lilac on the breast that's what it's named after Oliver, you are nine years old and you want to know why some birds are more colorful than others. And Oliver, that is such a wonderful question and it is a really, really good one as well. Um, and it all has to do with the different birds that we find out here and not only here, but all over the world and the different way that they attract um, a male or female actually. Most of the time, it also has to do with just the way they are sometimes. I know that both the male and female, so the boy lilac breasted roller and the girl lilac breasted roller are both colorful. So I have no way to tell you in this particular case if this is a male or a female. But Oliver, there are birds out there that the male has quite a different um, appearance than the female entirely. And we see that with a different kind of bird um, called a weaver, as well as some of the other birds called widers. Now, those are big words, I know, but some of them are really, really pretty. Uh, the males ch actually change color in a season, which is quite cool as well. They'll become more colorful for a time and then lose their color a little bit later on. But this lilac breasted roller stays colorful throughout the entire year. Now, right now, it's sitting very still. It's not moving around at all. And actually, I think I can see its feathers are being puffed out, everybody. Look very closely, and you can see that some of those feathers are being puffed out. And what that uh, lilac breasted roller is doing is it's trying to keep warm, like it's raining right now. And so because of that, uh, it is a little bit chilly. And if it was me and I was out in the rain, I would want to put a jacket on. But a lilac breasted roller can't put a jacket on like you and I can. So they can put on, uh, what they can do is puff up their feathers and try and trap as much heat as possible um, and near to their bodies. Ooh, Jade, you want to know if small birds can fly when it's raining? Yes, they most certainly can, but it does depend on how heavy the rain is. So right now, there's just a lighter drizzle in the air, so not too much water is falling from the sky. 
um, and if it was very very like a terrain like a really hard heavy downpour where you can't even walk outside because you can't see that's how hard the rain is falling then it doesn't matter if the bird is tiny or really really big and um, they wouldn't be able to fly in such hard rain but this sort of weather where it's on and off I can actually just to my left hand side see some small birds fluttering about and so this weather wouldn't um, stop them from being able to fly what is important though Jade is that once that um, those feathers are wet oh there we go it may fly back everyone it just landed on the ground behind this termite mound I think it maybe saw something to hunt so we'll keep an eye on that perch to see if it flies back um, but Jade just to oh there we go it's flown off to a different tree and landed behind the leaves so I don't think we're going to be able to show it to you all again unfortunately but Jay just to finish off what I was saying there is that once the bird has um, gotten a little bit wet they'll often perch just like that lilac breasted roller and then they'll fluff out their feathers and they'll shake them off to get rid of any excess water um, so that they can dry off and then be ready to be able to fly again because if a bird is too heavy with too much water in their feathers then they are not able to fly as easily so it's important that they get rid of that water all right everyone well that was wonderful start to our drive I'm going to reverse now and then head down this road part of the plan this afternoon is to go check if there's any hyena hyenas around some of the known den sites that we have on the property um, so we are going to head down I do see an impala just up ahead as well so we'll see maybe if we can stop for that as well Paige you are eight years old and you are asking if we can find some elephants Paige, we are going to do our best to find some elephants for you. Um, we actually just had some just behind that lilac breasted roller. I know I mentioned that just now, but they have moved off into some very thick bush. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to follow them into um, off road and into the bush because they're just going to keep moving away from us, Paige. But Elephants are one of my absolute favorite animals. I love spending time with them. So Paige, I'll be sure and I'll let Cedric know as well because there are two of us driving around Juma this afternoon. So hopefully we can find those elephants for you. Alright everybody we're still on our way down this road and like I said there's actually an impala up ahead so I'm just gonna slow down I don't want him to run off I'm just gonna go over this bump slowly and he's actually been looking at us the whole time And I saw him from when we had stopped for that lilac breasted roller. He was staring at us the whole time. And I said, we are going to come and have a look at you. I just hope that he stays out in the open for us all. Now, if you look on top of his head, uh, everybody you can see that they're these sort of brown things that are coming out of just above his eyes and he's moving away <laughs> and those are called horns I'm just gonna give it a second because I think he may come out just to our right he was walking slowly through the bush but those horns mean that he is a male impala he is a boy impala
female impalas don't have any horns on their heads. I'm just going to reverse a little bit. See if we can see this impala again. Oh, unfortunately, he's gone into the bush, everybody. So we're just going to drive slowly on and see what else we can find. It has started to rain a little bit harder. I might have to put my rain jacket on. <laughs> Oh, there's the Impala. I can see it again. All right, so we've re located this impala everybody he's just having a good look at us also very clever for him to go under that tree while it starts to rain quite hard He's just having a look at us. He's listening. Have a look at his ears, everyone. They're facing backwards. So he's looking forwards, but he's also listening to what's happening behind him. Well, this impala is being very serious with us all this afternoon. I haven't gotten a smell from him once, and Paul. Anna, you are six years old and you want to know if girl impalas ever get horns. Now, Anna, usually no. Usually it's only the males that have the horns on top of their heads like this. But there have been some cases where uh, a female has developed horns. They usually look a little bit funny. They don't look as pretty as the, the horns on this male, so perfect on top of his head. And what happens is that there are these things in our bodies called hormones and they tell the body to produce certain things. And in a male, that hormone uh, tells the body to produce horns. And usually the female doesn't have enough of that hormone to tell its body to produce that. But sometimes in the odd case, there is more of that hormone in a female than there usually is. And so she develops these sort of um, they are horns, but they are a little bit skinny and sometimes they twist around in funny ways. So Anna, there are cases where a female can develop uh, horns, but it's not the normal thing that we see out here. Well, we are going to carry on facing off with this impala for now. And there is someone else out here that wants to say hello to you. Thank you, Amy, and uh, a very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Cedric, and behind the camera with me on Rusty, we've got a panda. And, uh, well, it is quite a drizzly afternoon. I can see heavy clouds coming this way. I can see actually a carpet of drizzle that's heading into this direction. Sorry about my, my audio. It sounds like a little bit uh, muffled here. Yeah. I'm going to have to quickly double check on my audio. I do apologize. I have to take my tire coat off. <laughs> uh, I'm 
trying to get, oh my word, sorry, my, this is my, my mistake and it looks like my little cable came out there. It should be better now. Better? Thank you. <laughs> uh, it looks like, yeah. Uh, uh, all right, yeah. I do apologize for that. Like, I've got my rain coat on, so I've got like so many things happening here. And um, of course, the cable just got pulled out from the that little boxy thing. All right. Well. Let's move on. Let's move on. Anyway, so I'm going to do the western area here. I'm going to do the western side of uh, Juma. I'm going to go take a look down the uh, down this road, see if we get any luck. I'm sure some elephants for the afternoon will be great. Maybe some rosettes. Uh, that'll be fantastic. But uh, yeah, yeah the, uh, the the rain is slowly but surely coming in. It's a it's a huge carpet of rain. You can see it's like so grey out there. It's gonna hit us in the next few minutes. Luckily we've got our rain rooms on. We're all prepped. I've got my jacket on. And my rain jacket. Dry as a bone. Hopefully I can stay dry as a bone for the afternoon. Mm, yeah, no, I am gonna get uh, nicely wet here. Panda, I think we'll have to get the, the skirt out, huh? Yeah. All right. Ronnie, okay, oh, it's coming down now. All right, I'm, I do apologize. I have to jump out at the moment and uh, open my seat and pull out all the rain covers, yeah? Because I didn't think, I thought it was just gonna be a drizzle, but it's right coming down now. All right. So this is how we get our rain covers. We have to take uh, our seat off. The Land Rover, you take your seat off. You take a whole lot of other little plates out here. Another plate. And then you take the rain covers out from underneath the seat. This is for Panda, a nice big one. And this one will be for me, for the dashboard. And there we go. All right, Panda, you ready? It's, uh, I'm just going to pass that to Panda, he knows what to do there, and uh, oh, let's see if I can help him here. And then what we do, we have to put all these things back again, just to protect our equipment, because if you don't to protect the equipment, you've got uh, uh, batteries in here, and radios, and receivers, and transmitters, all interesting things. All right, so Panda is, uh, all right Panda, just let's sw swing this one around. Uh, all right. Luanda, we are just busy with rain kites here, or rain things. Sorry, just letting Luanda know what's happening, because I don't think he sees us doing this. All right, there we go. All right, there we go. Now I have to try and fathom my seat to get in here. All right, sometimes this seat does take a bit of time. God! <laughs> yeah, don't mess it. Yeah. All right, there we go. That's in. All right. And you know, typical Murphy's law, we get everything on and uh, it stops raining. All right, there you go. You ready, Panda? Oniva, see for play. Let's go on with our safari. Thank you for your patience. Thanks for <coughs> the support. <laughs> The joys of being in the bush, you always have to improvise. No, I was, uh, sorry Luanda, I was actually saying that to the viewers for their support. Thank you, and for your support, and for Jared, and for Tadiwa, and for everybody.
But yeah, that's the joys of the bush. So you always have to, you know, we have to improvise and uh, we have to always kind of get these things going. And uh, as well as if it starts raining quite heavy this side and we don't have these covers on, what happens is the water touches certain little points here and it's, uh, it could toast the entire uh, broadcast uh, unit that's on these vehicles. So safety first as well for our safety as well. First for our safety. The last thing we want is things to short circuit here behind us with our poor panda at the back there. Luckily he's got a luckily he's got a, a huge fire extinguisher with him if uh, that if that has to happen. Let's go down. So this little junction here is a uh, panda's favorite junction because there's always activity on this little junction. If you come here early morning, you always find fresh leopard tracks coming up here, hyena tracks, lion tracks. For some reason they love this junction. We always call this like the function at the junction. Hmm. Uh, it's raining now properly. All right, let's see what we can go find down this side. Maybe we'll head out to maybe like a dam or two down in the south here, or a little open clearing. Uh, animals like uh, this kind of weather, animals will tend to rather just take cover from the rain, go into the thick stuff, and try and avoid getting too wet. I think we chose like the worst uh, corner of Juma for some reason. It, it is, yeah, it's coming down here hard. other one somewhere here all right so I'm just looking for covers here trying to cover everything as quick as possible Rianda yeah you must yeah <laughs> you must know it's raining very hard yeah, and the equipment is getting a little bit drenched in certain places yeah just uh, letting you know we can't get to all the stuff that we need to get to while it's raining like this But it's nice, always good. I think rain is so important. We need rain, we need the water, especially before the winter comes, because winter time, we do not have any rain. So winter time is very dry, and we are slowly but surely heading into that season. So this last little bit of rain, water for the bush, for the animals, for everything, is so important. Water is life. Yes, water is life.
All right, let's go over to Amy. Indeed, indeed, Cedric. The rain is so important. Water is so important and it is important to remember that we need the rain we love the rain even if we have to get a little bit wet as we go along and we won't get too much more rain for the rest of the year and like cedric was saying it's the reason that the water holes can stay with water and keep these animals all alive now we have found a little herd of impalas. This is a little bit further down the road from the other one that we had earlier. And here you can actually see that there are a few, all of these are boy impalas. They all have the horns on top of their head. Some are just a little bit bigger than others. And that just tells us how old the impala is. So the bigger his horns, the older the impala is. And right now, some of them are out in the rain. Some of them are under the trees looking for a little bit of cover. As Cedric said, it is actually starting to get quite, um, uh, the rain is starting to get quite hard now. And if I was an impala, I would definitely be underneath the tree, <laughs> if I could be. Sorry, Luanda, I heard that Calvin was nine years old. He sent us a question, um, but you just broke up when you were telling me what he was asking. Oh, Calvin, you want to know if flooding ever happens in the bush? Yes, it certainly can flood. And there are some very famous years, um, if we look back over the last sort of 20 years or so, that um, even 25 years, where there have been very, very famous floods that have come through this area of the Greater Kruger National Park, which is where I am at the moment in the Sabi Sand Nature Reserve and there's one river actually called the sabi river um which runs down in the south of this um uh, reserve and that river can flood very 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 badly if it rains a lot um, and it has happened i think the most recent sort of really big rains that we had was actually last year i don't think it flooded the entire um reserve where we are at the moment but i do know a little bit further up north um a lot there was a lot of road damage and things like that so kelvin it definitely can flood in these areas now if we look closely at those impalas that are a little bit further back they're out in the open can actually see just how wet their coats are. Oh wow! Did everyone see that? It shook off like, just like a dog actually when they shake off um, after being in the rain or maybe going for a swim in the pool at home. Um, you could see the spray of water around their bodies. I'm just so happy that these impalas are here to say hello to us. Charlotte, you want to know if impalas are the same as deer? Um, no, uh, Charlotte, they are not the same. So impalas we only find here in the continent of Africa. Um, and deer you find, I think, in North America, um, some parts of Asia, if I'm not mistaken, and Europe. And the difference between them 
um, Charlotte, is that impalas have on top of their heads what we call horns. So these are a great example of that. I was telling you earlier that the boy impalas have the horns on top of their heads. And those are actually there all the time. They don't disappear um, all through the year. Whereas, um, there's Cedric saying hello. <laughs> um, whereas with deer, you find that those antlers only appear, well, first of all, they're called antlers, not horns. And um, they only appear at certain times of the year. They come out in the summer and then they lose them as they go into winter. So that's the major difference, um, Charlotte. Uh, impalas are known as antelopes, whereas um, the, the, the deer and all sorts of things. I mean, there's moose as well are also, and um, they have the antlers um, that are on top of their heads. Well, we are going to stay here and watch these impalas grazing. Now, the interesting thing about impalas, boys and girls, is that they eat both grass and leaves from trees. So we call them what is known as a mixed feeder. So they don't only eat grass, they don't only eat leaves from trees, they actually eat both. So right now, it looks like they are enjoying some grass but sometimes they may snack on a little bit of leaves from a tree or other little sort of fleshy plants that grow from the ground. It has started to a little bit harder. I'm not sure if you can hear it at all, but um, you can see these impalas moving off a little bit to the left hand side. So I'm not sure if they're going to go move into those bushes in order to try and keep a little bit dry. But what we must remember is that unlike us who are used to being in warm and cozy homes when it's raining, these uh, impalas and animals out here in general are so used to uh, the rain and it's part of their life they don't have a home where they can go and be sheltered from the rain and they have perfectly adapted to be able to survive out here even if it is quite wet at times So this rain has made it a little bit difficult for certain things, but that's all right. Um, I'm just trying to see if maybe we get some uh, tortoises for this afternoon. Um, usually with uh, rain like this, you'll find uh, tortoises that will come out, enjoy the rain, come and have a little bit of a drink in one of the puddles or two here. So yes, let's see if we can find a tortoise or a giant land snail. Mm. Like a snail that's very big. It's called a, it's called a giant land snail. The largest snail here that you get here in Africa. Let's see if we can find one. So we go very slowly. I always believe, go slowly down the road. Just keep your eyes peeled. 
for anything that's crossing the road. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of corrugation here, so there's a lot of bumps here, so <laughs> that's, a, that's one thing we have to keep our eyes open for. Oh, Mandy, we all go find a lizard anywhere around here, Mandy. A lizard, anywhere. Get the geckos and lizards and skinks all over the show here, so... Um, but they're so quick and small and they are well camouflaged. They're very small, so they'll be like this big and uh, they'll be pretty much against trees and, and all that. But you never know, we might get one around here. We'll see if we can find, maybe a, we might look for a Nile monitor at Twin Dams. I'm going to Twin Dams now, uh, one of the dams that's just here on the southern side of Juma. So I'm going to go to that dam and going to see maybe we get lucky with a Nile monitor that might be resting somewhere. But no sun, no heat today, so you'll find a lot of the reptiles will be more docile. In other words, they will not have that kind of energy like when it's very hot and sunny, like they are the solar panels of the bush, and then if it's nice, hot and sunny, then you'll find that uh, the reptiles are a little bit more active. They'll be a little bit more busy than on a cool, rainy afternoon. But let's see. Let's see. You might be lucky somewhere. Beverly, age 10. Um, you know, Beverly, <clears throat> we haven't seen owls for a very long time. I haven't seen one for quite some time, so Seeing them, you can see them during the day. Oh yes, so they'll get a roost somewhere. As well as you'll find like the small the little outlets and that quite busy in the late afternoons. Maybe like the the pool spotted outlet and the barred outlet. So yeah, you'll find them, but they're very small. But then you get the bigger ones like the spotted eagle owl or the verose eagle owl, barn owl, marsh owl. A little bit more nocturnal, moving more around and flying around at night time looking for rodents. Well actually the thing about the owls, they were the eagle owl, they, used to, they were nesting here not long ago. I know Steve had uh, one of the other naturalists, he had uh, a pair of spotted eagle owls on one of the roads just north of Twin Dams. So yeah, we can actually go and take a look there, see if we get lucky. I know Linda Poli loves owls, so I'm sure she'll be very happy if we find an owl this afternoon. Slowly coming up to Twin Dams here now. Uh, and we know that there is a lioness. Her name is Chella. And she's had cubs in this area, but we're not going to go take a look down there because we, we closed that area. But we're just going to. Maybe she might be lying around here taking a break from the youngsters. I'm hoping so. So we're just going to go have, have a little bit of a scratch around here. Luyanda, you know Chella, eh? I think Luyanda would know. I think, have you seen Chella before, Luyanda? So our director, do you want to see? Chat to us. Let us know, have you seen Chella? Chalk. Ah, oh, ah. Oh, fantastic, all right. Oh, that's nice, that's nice. Beautiful, beautiful 
a lioness. All right, so we're here at uh, Twin Dams. We're gonna just stop here for a little bit and we're gonna just uh, scan this area. Um, we're gonna try and see, because we've got a rain roof on, so we have to try and maneuver this a little bit more. And then we're also gonna try and see if we can look for that little Nile monitor that hangs around here. Let's see if we can find that Nile monitor. Hmm. And it usually, if it gets a fright, it actually dives into the water and it'll swim around. But I think because it's a little bit cool, I can get that. At least the rain has stopped. It's a beautiful dam. Linda, I've seen a croc. I've seen crocodiles coming down to this dam before, um, but very briefly, and then it moved off. A, a small one, not a big one, a small one. But we've got a big crocodile there in one of the other dams called Buffelzook Dam, a little bit further northeast of the yeah. I might actually end up going there because I saw a screen. I haven't seen him that uh, that crocodile at that dam yet. So, and I saw a screenshot. I think who saw it? The I think Amy saw it this morning, or was it Chet? Was it Amy this morning? Yeah. Oh, it was Amy this morning. And I looked at the screenshot, and it looks like it's missing the tip of the tail. So uh, it might, it, I think it's one of the crocodiles that's coming from Chitwa Chitwa, from the dam Chitwa Dam. And uh, I think that crocodile's coming all the way up here. I think it's Boris or Vlada, one of the two. But I'll have to go and double check on that. But from the screenshots it was taken from this morning, it seems like it was a big crocodile and it seems like it was one of those ones from Chitwa Dam. All right, let's quickly scan this area. Let's see if we can find that monitor here somewhere, maybe lying hidden away. Just listening to nature a little bit, just listening to the sounds. Unfortunately, don't see anything close to the water area for that monitor. It might be tucked away somewhere else, or it might be in the riverbed. Sometimes they'll go and dig up some frogs from the riverbed. I think it doesn't look like too much happening around here. I thought we were going to get lucky there. All right, let's uh, let's head off again. Okay, let's go a little bit further up here, Panda. Let's see if we're lucky there. Reverse out of here. some blue skies a little bit of blue skies coming through here that's lovely for the afternoon 
perfect. Hopefully this, uh, maybe the clouds will start burning away. Are we still there? Hello, little Uganda. Are we still around? Are you still there? Welcome back everybody and we have just taken a stop here um, there was a male rhino that moved just past us unfortunately he has gone into the bushes over there he was a very unsure um, and actually trotted Ivy and was a little bit skittish so we're not gonna try and follow him any longer but it was very 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 exciting I must say and um, for those of you who may not know what a rhino looks like it is a big gray animal a little bit smaller than an elephant I can actually just see his tail moving in the background but it is very tricky to try and get a view. I'm gonna move forward a little bit and pull just to see. Oh, he might be moving to the left hand side there. If I do see him come out in the open a bit more, then we'll try and. Well, there he is, everybody, just right at the end of our kids' drive for a few minutes. Hopefully, he will stay around. Now, I am not going to move any closer at all. I don't want to put any pressure on this rhino at all and um, he's actually having a bit of a rub there against the um, wooden post or tree log that's fallen over there there you can just see his face And he was full of mud, absolutely covered from ear to tail in mud. And now he's come to this uh, fallen over log and it looks like a bush willow tree for a little bit of a rubbing post. And I am just looking with my binoculars and I can see he's rubbing the base of his horn against the tree now. Well, we have managed to find this male rhino again, everyone. He's behind the trees and I was explaining earlier that I'm not gonna try and reposition again. 
I've already come a bit closer and he has been a little bit um, I don't want to say afraid but just uncomfortable uh, with the vehicle being a bit too close or when he's out in the open and and that so he's just behind the tree there I'm not sure if you can hear any of the sounds but he's busy rubbing against a fallen over tree because he was absolutely covered in mud Sorry, Luanda, can you just go again with that question from Cody, please? You can see the tip of his face there now. Well, Cody, you are nine years old and you want to know if rhinos can run really fast. They most certainly can you definitely won't be able to outrun a rhino cody um i'll have to double check the exact speed but it's definitely about 40 to 45 kilometers per hour and i think in miles that might be about 20 miles an hour they can run at charging speed so very very quick indeed And I know it's not the greatest view, but how cool is it even just to see this massive animal from this angle? And we are so incredibly lucky, everyone. I cannot tell you how happy I am. Now a rhino like this, if you have a look, you can see how pointy its ears, is, bo ears are, boys and girls. And it also has a very, very big flat mouth. And this tells us that it is a white rhino. And you can see him actually chewing a little bit, I think. That mouth moving slightly. And those big nostrils right there on the tip of the nose, all the better to smell you with. And that's because rhinos can't see very well, but they can hear and smell very well. Now to all the boys and girls who have joined us today, thank you so, so, so much. I have had a wonderful drive with you all this afternoon. So from myself and Cedric and the rest of the Wild Earth team, thank you so much for joining us. We do hope that you all will stick around as well as we continue with the afternoon safari. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised.
Hello, good afternoon. Once again, my name is Cedric and behind the camera with me on Rusty, we've got Panda. And uh, yes, thanks for joining us on our Sunset Safari. It is cloudy, it's very grey, we've had a bit of rain. And uh, well, I'm hoping it's going to subside, but it just seems like there is um, a lot more rain on its way towards us. But that's all right. That's never going to dampen anything from uh, from our sides. But yet, joining us on our sunset safari this afternoon. Well, let's just say set. I don't think there's any sun. Let's just say set safari. <laughs> it's going to be on Wendy. It's going to be Amy and the Muscles and Paul, and our beautiful team there in Johannesburg is Luanda. Tadiwa and Jared and Tech will be, I think Simba, I think Simba or Lorato, or Lasejo, uh, or John. <laughs> this is live, this is interactive, so if you've got any comments or questions that you want to send through to us, if you are watching on the Wild Earth uh, website, wildearth.tv, make sure you register with us so we can, or so you can. Question. YouTube channel. All right, I am getting slowly but surely towards ooh, some oh, some crested Franklin. At the moment, the grass is all wet all over the show. And these crested Franklins uh, they feel like they don't want to cross. Rather stick. To the road. Uh, stick to the okay. Dropity drop. <laughs> that was so cute. Says with me. Mom. Well, we do apologize for losing Cedric there, everybody, but we have repositioned here a little bit further and um, able to get a lovely little gap, which we are super lucky. We didn't have to get any closer um, or sort of approach him at all. So he's looking super comfortable and you can actually see what he's doing there with this fallen over stump having a good little chin rub at the moment. A chin rub and a chew, it looks like. The Nutty Prof, you want to owe my word. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? Luanda, please tell me we got that. <laughs> so as he leaned over his belly, on this fallen over tree there was some flatulence to put it politely oh my word that was so funny sorry natty prof but uh, unfortunately the rhino stole the show there You want to know what we packed for snacks? I've got some jelly teddies. I do love a jelly teddy. Um, an apple. And Paul's just eaten a peach. So he's enjoying that. Um, but we both did have lunch before we came out. So luckily, don't need too many snacks today. We are looking forward to dinner when we get back, though. By then, I'm sure we'll be hungry. 
I'm really trying to figure out what this rhino is doing. It's like he's licking the bark or where he's put all this mud. And I'm not sure why. Maybe it's something to do with scent. I thought he was chewing initially, but I can see now that it looks like he's almost putting his lips on the bark and no tasting it. Maybe rubbing his lips on there. Maybe they're a little bit itchy. I'm not sure. <laughs> Now, if we have a look at where ones should be, and then also just around his face, you can see a bit of a lighter colour. There is a bit of mm, sort of dirt, it looks like, around his face. Now, that is not actually dirt, but uh, indeed, I think his dung. So, what he's done there, I can see a bit of bits of grass there in between his horns, and. He might have actually rubbed his head down, possibly getting some dung on his face. Could also just be rubbing in the dirt, but that particular texture is looking like a bit of rhino, some of his own dung that he's put his, his nose into. Jackie darling, you want to know how many sets of teeth a rhino has? As far as I know, they have the adult set which lasts them. They're not like a um, elephant where, you know, they have a conveyor belt of teeth that go through. <sighs> he did it again. <laughs> that is amazing. This is just too entertaining. I actually can't believe our luck. If you were going to tell me we were going to see this in, in port this afternoon, I wouldn't have believed you. using his lips there against this log such interesting behavior I love learning more and more about animal species and rhinos unfortunately we don't get to see so many of them anymore um, and it's so nice to be able to just spend a bit of time observing new behavior for myself and trying to understand and get to know these incredible animals better. Wow. Sam Adele, you say this looks like an itchy boy. I mean, absolutely, he has been rubbing himself up and down all over, underneath, sides, there he goes again, for the belly. <laughs> I'm surprised we haven't heard any more sounds coming from his backside there. Oh, now he's going to reverse into it, get it between the legs. Right, 
So I'm just starting the vehicle and moving forward a little bit, changing our angle here. It looks like he's come to another um, rubbing post to rub his horn on. Sometimes one just needs to be quiet and enjoy the magic of this moment. You can see how he's able to use that little broken off stump of a tree to scratch up against the sort of stump of his horn. Alright, so we made our way to the northeastern corner of Juma. We've got, uh, got a little rusty here to Biffleswick Dam, and we've got a beautiful grey heron as always around here. And uh, trying to see if it's going to get any luck with some fish around here. So we're going to wait very patiently with this heron. As you can see, the little drops from the rain that's falling down on top of the water. And we are just going to hunker down here for a little bit. There's a huge cloud that's coming past here with, uh, with some rain. And we're just going to enjoy this dam for the time being. And not too far in front of this grey heron. Well, you can't actually see now. It's, it's gone under. But there was the big crocodile. is maybe about five, six meters in front of that grey heron. But it's gone under underneath. And, uh, well, you never know. You can, you can imagine that uh, crocodile come bursting out of the water then, grabbing that poor grey heron. That would be a little bit sad for the heron. I think the croc hasn't got enough energy for now. With a day like this, where there hasn't been any sun at all, I think that poor crocodile is on a very low battery life at the moment so an energy I think it's just floating around underwater I'm not going to do too much for now but this guy here and it almost looks like a statue just standing very still not really in hunting mode he's not really looking down into the water when any fish it's Alexi do birds preen their feathers yes they do they try and preen their maintain their feathers on the rainy days for sure they will try and keep their feathers nice and neat maybe grabbing some moisture from the feathers as well while they while they preen it and so just to kind of release like a little bit of an, an oil substance that actually kind of just coats their feathers and actually protects their feathers from water, from rain, from the dampness. That's why we always say water on a duck's back. Because when the water falls on a duck, duck's back, what happens? It just rolls off. It just slides off. 
out of the oil. I've got a feeling it's the calm before the storm, not talking about the rain, talking about maybe a sighting or two that might develop very shortly somewhere. <laughs> Brianda, that's exactly a lacquer rainy leopard. That's it. I'm sure we'll get one somewhere, yeah? We've got... Oh, okay, we've got the three banded plovers chasing each other here. I wonder how those little eggs are doing. When, did you get, have you seen those eggs yet uh, again, Panda? I haven't... Uh, are they still there? I'll, actually, we'll go take a look very shortly at the nest. So there's little birds called the three-banded plover. You can hear that high pitch noise at the moment. That's actually a three-banded plover. I don't you can see it at the bottom here. There's one that's running at the bottom. This next to the shoreline here. There it is. There. Very small. Now you can imagine how small the chicks are going to be. It's a very small bird. Catching all the little insects. Oh, that's gone behind the rain roof uh, pole. We do have our rain roofs on, so we are a little bit limited with uh, our panning. We've got our hippopotamus, a few of them. Now we must take a look if we can find little redders. Now, Redders is a small little calf that uh, has been hanging around Gary Dam or coming towards this dam, Biffelzook Dam. And we just want to see if we can maybe see that little head popping out here. There's two or three hippos here, but they're all older ones. Well, uh, Russell, a bird as small as a plover to protect its young. If there's like a monitor lizard that's busy moving towards it, they'll try and dive bomb it or try and kind of just lure it away. You know, try and let the let the monitor lizard rather go for, for the adult and uh, try and lure it away from the nest itself. But they'll also try and kind of do that like uh, with dive bombing where they kind of dive down to the predator. But I mean, if the predator's too big, it's just going to be no use then. It's not always successful with that. Oh, the rain has just now started. Proper. Lovely. I'm glad we have hunkered down here at Bifflesook Dam for now. I've got my binox here now. I just want to see if we can get that little hippo calf. Thanks, Luanda. Yeah, no, we are covered up properly now. We are very comfortable, yeah. Thank you. I'm just trying to see if we can find that little calf, but it's going to be so tough. You just see the nostrils coming up. You don't see anything else. You just see nostrils taking in a breath. So clearly they are resting on a nice, cool afternoon. Not too much activity. A lot of bubbles. <laughs> There's a lot of bubbles going on there. <laughs> it's almost like when you take a glass, an empty glass, and you tip it, tilt it upside down and you go underwater with it and then you kind of slowly release the, the air out. Maybe he's going to... Oh, looks like that hippo likes blowing bubbles. Look at that. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Tom, it depends on which heron you're talking about. Um, I've seen a goliath here and there in the sand river pulling out a, a proper size catfish, barbel. Um, oh, um, 
a, a big one. Uh, that uh, the Goliath heron, of course, is the largest of the heron species that we have here, hence the name Goliath. And it pulled out a huge catfish and it struggled to actually even uh, put that ca catfish uh, down its throat because uh, it seemed like it bit too much off more than it can actually chew. But he got it right, eventually, with a lot of effort. And I think it must have been very uncomfortable for a few minutes. But it got it right. But like this grey heron now, they will really just go for the small little tilapias, small silverfish that's swimming around here on the surface, as well like little frogs as well. So plenty of little frogs that's in the area. You know, you've got your little platanas and you've got your little stream frogs, little grass frogs that's a little bit further out. So there's a lot of little amphibians and it's still lurking around you, which uh, the grey heron will go for. Yeah, step back. There's a crocodile not too far in front of you there. I think you better step back. <laughs> I will not any further than that. I don't see the croc is... I don't see the head again. No, it's still... I'm sure, I'm sure the croc is lurking there somewhere. Ooh, there. Well, there's a little grey dacre, but difficulty... Oh, it just ran off. Don't worry. It's one of those animals that uh, as soon as it spots a vehicle, it will not hold back. It's just going to do one thing and that's run. If you don't see the little hippo, yeah, I won't be surprised. Maybe he's gone north, gone to one of the... Maybe he's gone north to other dams, maybe towards uh, a big dam just uh, inside Biffleshook. It's just a property that's north of uh, Juma. And, uh, you know, he could have gone into that area as well. And maybe using these certain dams. Oh, there comes a daker now. Sorry, Panda. I think we might just get a, a little bit of that daker. There's a little grey dacre. Hello! Come down to the water. There's nice water here. So, oh, there's another one. There's two. It looks like... That's nice, because they are solitary. So I just want to see... It looks like a male and a female. So they're monogamous. So male and female will be partners for life. It's a female and... That's a male on the right, okay. So that's a, like a young male. And my little horn's coming through. Oop. Oop. A little bit of a spring in his step. So these are one of our smallest antelopes that we have here in the northern Sabi Sands. Them and the Steenbok. We don't get really the Klipspringer here because we don't have those rocky outcrops, but uh, the Steenbok and the Daker are the smallest little ones. Ah, oh, Kalihonda, yes. Red, I know that red Daker we get uh, more often towards the Nalsprite area. I remember staying in Nalsprate and we had like a, a nature reserve pretty much there in town, or in the city. And uh, they got to see the red dacre quite often that side, but not, the, yeah. Yeah, it's more the grey dacre that we do see. And they're always, always very, very skittish. They're very scared of their vehicles. You can imagine being this small and you've got all these predators around you. You've got leopards and lions and hyenas and all that. Yeah, you're always going to be nervous. And they're part of the Christ 
I mean, Christ shop. <laughs> shop Christ what God's thinking about another dwarf antelope. They're part of the dwarf antelopes. And the shops, Christ book, but we don't get them here. That we get further north into Kruger. Beautiful as well. Hello, everyone. You just arrived as a splash was coming down from the roof. And um, I am still bumbling about. We left that runner to carry on with his day. He finished off and wandered off into the bushes, so we weren't gonna um, try and keep up too close with him. He clearly wanted to move away from us. So that is fine. We had our fair share of time with him, and what a fantastic sighting it was. Definitely my highlight so far. And in case anyone hasn't mentioned it yet, it is raining and now it is raining properly. I can see around us that sort of mistiness and it's really set in and although it's not very hard, it is constant and I am just very glad that I wore my rain pants today. Now I'm just driving a little bit slower as well so we don't get blasted with water especially for me while driving uh, but so far so good we had a few doves in the road um, actually walking around in this rain which was quite interesting <laughs> but unfortunately they flew off before we could show them to you So we will have to see if there's any other animals that are willing to brave the rain and come out and say hello to us. Sounds like Cedric's been enjoying his time at Buffelshook Dam, which is wonderful. It is a beautiful um, place there. I enjoyed my time at that waterhole this morning. Oh, apparently there was a sighting of a grey diker by the dam, which is very, very cool. They don't usually stick around too long, <laughs> I must say. Uh, a sighting of a diker usually lasts two seconds and then they've gone into the bush. Daniel, you want to know if there's any forests around this area? Um, in the immediate vicinity, no. We wouldn't classify the biome that we're in as forest habitat at all. It is far more uh, savanna, uh, bushveld, that we know. But a little bit further away, um, or maybe hundred kilometers or so from here sort of I think in that direction and um, there's a little called Ripscorp and that particular sort of mountain that is up alongside of it so
So I think what we're going to do, oh, sorry, we're just trying to get comfortable here. I think the rain, luckily it's not this side, I think the rain is down in the south of Juma. So I'm going to stick to the north. I'm going to do a bit of the boundary. I'm going to go into the northern boundary and see what we can find. Bye, Pose. Yeah, my, my reps will be nice for the afternoon. I think that'll be a nice, uh, a nice surprise if we can get uh, that young male leopard. And uh, phew, when last did we see my, my reps? I think that's the 16th of Jan. Uh, I think that's a long time. I think it was 16th of Jan that we saw my reps last. Oh, some nice fresh buffalo tracks here yeah? and dung. Oh yeah, that, yeah, I remember that one, but then we saw him again. Where did we see him? Where did we see him? Oh yeah, was, he was damn cam. I don't know, it was will find out for us. I know Tadiwa will do a, a tiki tiki there on the, on the computer. Get us. Nice, Tadiwa. Oh, sorry, I just went. Standing by. How's it? Any updates? No, nothing, nothing, nothing. I just, uh, uh, nothing at the moment, sorry. Copy. Yeah, there were breakaways when I crossed up, there were taxes, scratches, I'm going to go for that. All right, go ahead, Dan. I'm going to go um, on uh, Buffelsburg Dam, uh, Buffelsburg Boundary. So I'm going to come slowly in a westerly direction just to see if any luck this side. Come here. Sorry, I'm just letting him know quickly. Uh, 26th of Jan. <clears throat> 26th of Jan. That's the last time we saw Marips. Wow. All right. So that's uh, almost a month ago. Well, that's not too bad. I think we've. Uh, I think we've been actually missing him much longer than that before. But he's here in the north. He's yeah. I've got some one or two updates at time with him having a kill there, just uh, on a place called Hardekul, and he had a kill there. So yeah, he's been in the north. That's how I want to do the northern boundary. Just want to double check yeah. to see. If uh, he hasn't come straight south onto Juma, well, we'll do it slowly. Oh, I can see the rain. <laughs> that rain's coming. <laughs> yeah, it's coming slowly. <laughs> it's coming slowly. Uh, sorry, I don't because I opened my jacket just now, thinking I was getting a little bit warm, being a little bit optimistic about. Uh, the rain's stopping for us for the for the time being. Uh, I think I jumped the gun there. All right, there we go. Prepped. Oh, Mazemba, Carl. I'm not too sure. Last with Mazemba, I, I can't tell you exactly. It's, he's been all over. Last I was there, then he was there. I, I, uh, Carl. Sorry, uh, if I tell you, I'm lying. He's just a nomadic male. He's also just pushed out to other places looking for an area for himself. Yeah. No, no, no idea there. Oh. Sorry, I just had to quickly re just my cap there because you can get these little raindrops coming into my eyeball. I do apologize if we do have a little bit of a break in picture here. I know this little dip is a little bit weak in uh, signal side of things. Uh -oh. 
Who's that from? A Sable, Abel, Dable, Rabel, Abel, Sable. Oh, Mabel. <laughs> Mabel. <coughs> Mabel, um, I heard, uh, heard about the Talamati. Uh, this guy just told me now, Talamati break, uh, or Talamati pride. I was in uh, close to Jakarna Lodge, Jakarna Dam, and that's just inside Buffalo's Hook, coming south. So I'm going to go and take a look around there. That's all. South Western. Push. See them coming back. Yeah, they must come back. They must make another kill for us. There we go. All right. Welcome back here yeah, everyone. We have arrived at Treehouse Dam and have seen a water thickney that seems to be darting out into the open, braving the rain. Um, it looks like it might head off into some shelter very, very soon. It really has now started to rain quite hard. You can actually see the drops there on the water. And it is a lovely, lovely soaking rain that we are having here this afternoon. Now the idea was to come here and just have a look, see if there is anything else happening, anything else coming out. Um, or maybe The water hole. But it is quiet, it is still, although I did hear what oh, sounds like a starling around us. <laughs> But it's also beautiful in its own way and I think that's what I enjoy so much about the bush is that there are so many aspects to it and even if what if one experiences weather that isn't necessarily perfect uh, there's still enjoyment that we can have and still um, make the most of what we can see. And it's also fun to drive in the rain. <laughs> oh, there's a dove just here on the right. I don't know if it's going to stay in view. Ooh, canine girl, interesting question. You want to know if crocs have a sense of smell out of the water? And yes, I would think they most certainly do. Just because they're not 
in the water doesn't mean that their nose stops working as such so I definitely still think that they can smell um, and also that would partly be I suppose in a way how they would um, know as well you know water has a scent and animals can sometimes pick that up especially when moving from water hole to water hole Little dove, you need to get out of this rain. <laughs> I'm actually surprised it hasn't flown up into the tree. what it's what is going through its head at this point obviously it doesn't mind it doesn't look actually too wet to be honest it, do, it doesn't look like it's completely soaked we've just been following a bird in the rain and there's actually another bird and paw straight ahead of us on the right hand side of the track there's another water thickney that has come out into the open and doesn't seem too worried about the water at all can see he's actually got a feather out of place just on the right on the tail Beverly you want to know why less animals come to the water while it's raining um, Beverly there's a few different reasons I think because it's not that hot usually when it's raining we experience cooler weather that animals don't Feel the need to come and cool down and often um, we see animals coming to the water not only necessarily to find something to drink but sometimes just to cool down their body temperature secondly I think when we are experiencing rain animals try and find shelter or sort of tuck themselves away until it's over and that means they just have a break and um, so they don't need to venture out and and you know just like wind in a way sometimes rain can compromise um, prey species uh, senses uh, well all animals but if you think about coming out to the open it is a more risky move for them it could be something lying in wait also taking advantage of a little bit of rain and then of course if they were coming for water or if they needed water with the rain falling usually they get enough of that off the vegetation that they are eating well that thickney has just run off into the grass i am going to move a little bit forward see if we can spot anything else from a different position otherwise we are going to move off and carry on Oh, um, Luanda, you broke up completely there. I'm so sorry. If you wouldn't mind just repeating, please. Oh, 
Oh, Chico, you want to know if these are the last rains before the um, winter? It may very well be, Chico. Um, we're going to try this thick knees popped out again just to our right hand side and Paul's going to try and put it on. I do apologize if there's a pole that pops into view. It is moving a bit haphazardly. <laughs> I'm also fascinated by that loose feather that's just hanging off the back of its tail. If it was me, I would no doubt have tried to pluck it out by now. But Chico, it is, it is getting to that time of the year where this could be the last sort of proper bit of rain. I do see that this next week is sort of overcast. Um, predictions for a few thunder showers to come through. So maybe not the last rain that's going to fall from the sky for this half of the year just yet. But it is nice to just have a little bit of a boost of rain um, to just fill up a few little pans and water holes are just that little bit extra. The thickness still moving around there. All right, and Paul, I think we have made the most of every little birdie and every little thing that we can see here at Treehouse Dam. So I think for now we are going to carry on down the road. The rain has lifted a bit, which is fantastic news. Just so that we can see a little bit clearer and maybe that means animals will move around a little bit more so that shower has passed but it's actually amazing how much they could be to see if you just willing to sit around a little bit like I didn't see those water thickness at all when we first arrived Well, we had Baobab Dam and what a beautiful scene we've got here. Oh, isn't this stunning with a big male elephant that is uh, just feeding along uh, the dam and the rain that is belting down in the back end and uh, yeah, it is uh, very, very wet at the moment. So once again, we have hunkered down. Oh, the elephant's seen something. But a beautiful male, isn't he? Slowly ambling along. And a lovely time for elef elephants on these cool afternoons with this rain. It's lovely for them, so they're not, um, they don't have to worry about jumping into the water and having a bit of a pool party because it's pretty much they are getting wet as it is. Slowly drinking and moving. And slowly they're going to move out of frame. Don't go. Stay. We are at the, this dam. I was hoping that maybe the Talamati pride came south, but so far, no luck on those lions. It's always nice just to sit here and watch this elephant and see what else comes down. And quite a big boy. I mean, we are sitting far away from him, and we can just see the size. And I'm sure you can hear the rain belting against our, our rain roof. Uh, we aren't going to move anywhere from this side for now. Ooh. 
So they quickly hear someone calling me. Yeah, standing by. Yeah, you can pass if you love, but you can pass, no problem. All right, Kashan from here, eh? Yeah, that's fine. Copy, thank you so much. And there he goes, there goes the elephant. Bye bye! I just got an update from one of the gentlemen now saying that uh, yeah, unfortunately the Telemati Pride is quite far from here. I was hoping that they would have been a little bit closer, but uh, they're quite far in Buffelzok, far north. So the way we are looking now, we are actually looking at the boundary, just behind the dam wall is the boundary from uh, Buffelzok to Manialeti Reserve. And you can see it's very hazy. Well, there's some hippos inside there. You'll see like just a little black dot in the water. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a hippo that's just floating around there. There's quite a few hippos at Baobab Dam. Always a nice pod, yeah. Well, afternoon, Dan. There's no updates. Garpy, thank you so much. Jane, yeah, I think I don't. I've never really taken notice with elephants uh, when it's thunder and lightning and all that. Um, I haven't really taken notice if they're actually going to start running from it or take cover from it. Um, it just seems like they're always, uh, you know, just ambling along and doing what they do normally. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody has witnessed an elephant running from lightning. I have seen impalas uh, bolting off. So yes, I have seen that, but other than that, I haven't really seen elephants uh, really becoming too nervous about something like that. I apologize for the vehicle that's just coming past us. Yeah. But I would think maybe they might get a little bit of a, a fright, you know, there's lightning. And lightning strikes close to them. You know, if it hits a tree or something, I'm sure they may I'm sure the elephants will pick up on that very very quickly, much easier than we will. And it'll be quite a bang to them. So Yeah, just think that logically they should get a bit of a fright from the lightning. I get a fright. I had a, no, my worst, uh, oh, there he's going across the road. No, oh, he's already crossed us. There goes the elephant. He's crossing the road. Why did the elephant cross the road? <laughs> to get to the other side. <laughs> All right, uh, Panda, let's see if we can go get this elephant. He's uh, right here. I think he's right here. I'm just going to cover up here quickly. All right. Oh, just want to empty all this water off the covers. All right, let's go. It's not too far. Not too far. I'm going to just amble very slowly. Watch the water that's going to fall down here. A couple of. Uh... All 
All right, well, we're going to try and get to that elephant. Let's head over to Amy. Everybody, we had an impala here. He was beautifully out in the open. <laughs> and I was so happy to see some signs of life that um, I thought, let's just show him to you all. And also the rain has, I don't know, don't have any wood to touch at the moment, but uh, completely stopped, <laughs> which I'm very, very happy about but he has unfortunately moved off. So I think we are going to have to carry on down the road. Now we are heading in the direction of Twin Dams. So we are gonna carry on doing that. We might actually see this Impala again. I do see he's just behind the tree starting to browse. So if I do it very slowly, maybe we'll be able to put him on for you all. Annabelle, absolutely, the bush felt is stunning in the rain. Like I say, it's just a completely different dynamic, a different feeling when it is like this. I actually really enjoy this moment now when the rain has stopped. Sorry, everyone, there is just, we have a roof on and there's a pole now that's just come into view. So I'm going to pull forward a little bit more just so that we get a better view of the Simpala. Well, we'll try, we'll try and get a better view for you all. There we go. Um, and it is just beautiful. There's all these little sparkles all over the place, which are the little hanging drops of water that are on the leaves, on the pieces of grass. And maybe we'll actually do a close up just now of this of of those sort of um droplets hanging on the grass uh, fluorescent sort of the flowering part of the grass uh, your vehicle is making funny sounds right? Sharp. All right, everyone, I think we are going to leave this Impala to carry on munching away. I don't know, doing his thing as an Impala does in the rain. And Cedric has found that elephant again. So you are going to head over to him. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, we have caught up with uh, that big male elephant that came across from Baobab Dam towards uh, Juma. As you can see, he is now enjoying some lovely leaves around Jay. I think he's loving life at the moment. Perfect for him. Perfect. I always say, why is he alone? I'm sure a lot are thinking, why is he alone? Well, first of all, elephants in the Greater Kruger Park, they can get to about 60, plus minus 60 years old. Now, getting to that age, it's almost like us. So when elephants, when young males in the family herd gets to the age of about say 16, 17, 18 years old, you know they get to that like late teens. What happens then is testosterone of course climbs and uh, pretty much they become a little bit more aggressive than normal. You know, like kind of reaching those teenage years and they start pestering the younger calves in, those, uh, in the elephant herd. And then you'll find that the matriarch, and as well the other females, the older females in those family herds, they do not tolerate that young male's aggression and attitude with the younger calves. And then they will start becoming upset with them, and then the females will start pushing those younger males out. 
It's like, no, it's time to go. It's time to go. You are becoming very naughty. You, you know, you're becoming too aggressive with the young ones. It's time to move on. And eventually you'll find that the male elephants, they'll start uh, peeling off from the, those family herds when they get pushed out. And then they will venture on by themselves or sometimes they'll join older males like this big male is a nice old male come and join older males and just to gain experience on what to do and how to do things you know where to go how do I serve, how do I live as a, as a single male now how do I live without my family and that's where these older males will kind of teach these younger males how to go about that and it's very interesting that's why I love that's one thing I love about elephants. It's all about learning from the elders. It's like us. You know, if we do not have, if we don't get taught by our parents or grandparents or wherever, if we don't get taught and that what happens, you pretty much become naughty, you know, or a little disciplined for, for, you know, for some time. You don't have that kind of teaching. And it's the same with elephants. If they don't get that teaching, you know, they can become problem elephants. Clearly this male hasn't got any other males. <laughs> the under you say it's, sounds like uh, sounds like the like the guy that you went to high school with. Alrighty then. <laughs> yeah, I know, trust me, I've got a few friends like that as well, so yep. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, mister, you can come out from that thicket. So we can't really move too much from where we are now. I was hoping that he will make an appearance again. Oliver, wow, how will elephants react with guests that's put on like heavy deodorant, perfume, that kind of stuff? Oh, well, you, Oliver, I don't think they'll react too much. I've had, trust me, I've had guests that I could smell them from a mile away. That's uh, sitting behind me, of course, and uh, it seems like they emptied the entire bottle of uh, perfume on them and um, got into sightings and it didn't, uh, didn't really affect any of the animals. So, yeah, I don't think it's going to be too much of a problem. There was a gentleman many years ago, there was a gent, funny I talk about perfume. There was a gentleman, I can't remember, I think it was from France. And said, hey, Sadiq, you must use a certain cologne. And the cologne will attract Lupardo. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't think so. He says, yeah. It was tested and it was <laughs> to attract a leopard. I'm like, ah. Uh. And he actually even gave me the name of that uh, cologne. I can't even remember what it was. I thought, yeah, and I look, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I've asked a few people about that and they said, nah, I don't think that is true. Yeah, Leander, I think it's something. Yeah, they said they think it's like a scent mark. The leopard thinks it's like another leopard scent marking there, and then uh, it gets attracted to that cologne. And he was a photographer, and he, he apparently he brought this cologne with every time. And uh, if there was, you know, a leopard sighting, he told me, "Oh no, I used to use it at leopard sightings." I'm like, "Oh, okay, that is uh, a little bit uh, bad, you know. Are you spraying yourself, or where, where are you spraying the cologne?" Um, so, so yeah, uh, that's what I heard. How true that is? Uh, well, that is pretty much debatable. Got a stunning tusks on him. Not the longest uh, of tusks. Nice and thick tusks. And I think we'll just be patient here. Yeah. Never know, we might pop out for us again. I 
he is enjoying that bush. Jackie Darling. Well, I haven't heard from you for, for a very long time. Well, Jackie Darling, yes, uh, I can imagine uh, the UK. The UK and the UK's weather. Yeah, this is UK. This is UK weather. But the difference here is it's not cold. It's just grey, grey and rainy. But it's very welcoming. Love it. As I say, it's very comfortable for us. And it's nice just to see. The ground that's a little bit wet again and it's not that amount of water or rain that is going to fill up any dam or even a pan yeah I'm not too sure if it's um, I heard uh, I heard Dan and I heard Roy coming on so maybe just give them a shout And Daniel, Daniel. Yeah, how's it run? Uh, yeah, Ron, I'm not gonna get a tumor. You can check my spot there. So we were also talking about sensors the other day. Actually, it was very interesting. So we got, uh, uh, actually Amy sent us a, a few, like a, hey, hey, hey. where is this now? So I just want to go through the stuff here and just to see if I can, Can't find it now. Almost there. Okay, there it is. So it's quite interesting. So looking at the sensors and the sensors for elephants. Uh, talking about sensors. Sensors means they count uh, how many elephants or how many you know specific uh, species that's in the area and uh, uh, in the Greater Kruger National Park, 2.2 million hectare. And the census that was taken down for elephants in 2021, so pretty much three years ago, the amount of elephants in the Greater Kruger National Park was put roughly, this is a rough estimate, don't forget, this is a rough estimate, at 27,419 elephants that they have counted here in the Greater Kruger National Park. I always thought it was like a little bit less. I thought it was about 16,000, 17,000. So this shows you. Seven, 27,000 elephants in the Greater Kruger Park. But as I said, that is just uh, that is just now, I can say, a rough estimate. And they say in the southern side of Kruger National Park, in the southern Kruger, they work out there's around about 15,800 elephants in the southern side of Kruger National Park. Hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of elephants, if you think about it. Between, say, between 25 to 30,000 elephants. That's a, a decent amount. And they're saying that, and they say the carrying capacity, and they say the carrying capacity for the Greater Kruger Park on drought times is around about 12,000 elephants. So that's what the Kruger, Kruger National Park can carry or will uh, hold onto about 12,000 elephants in drought times. So now, outside of drought, like now, we're not in drought at the moment, you put in maybe another 2,000 or 3,000 elephants added onto that, you know, if it's outside from drought. So I'd say about 15,000 elephants carrying capacity. And where I got that information was from a, a very well-known gentleman, yeah, that used to do a lot of sensors, a lot of, uh, 
I can say management of animals here in the Greater Kruger Park. There was a gentleman by the name of Ian White. And Ian White was uh, involved in many, many uh, programs and research around the side. No, Tom, uh, so elephants' home range. So these elephants will travel throughout the Kruger. They won't really kind of, their home range, you know, they will travel like some of the males will end up from the south to the north. I remember there was a big male named Duke, D U K E, Duke. Big male, big tusks, and he used to hang around on the southern side of Kruger. Eventually, they, some of the people saw him all the way up towards the Tarbush and Wet Sea. So, you know, that's how far they go far. So, they go travel through the, throughout the Kruger slowly but surely. They will move around. And they're not territorial, they're not like lions and leopards where they've got a set area, a territory where they pretty much remain in that area and scent mark. And patrol the area. Yay! Good afternoon, Mr. Only you have kind of <laughs> had a, a brief glimpse of him there. <laughs> he said, Okay, well, you're gonna see me now. Oh, he's coming, he might come out for us. What do you think? Yeah, very slowly. Alrighty, well we're going to leave this male elephant, I'm sure he's going to disappear further west and he, while he does that, let's head over to Amy to see what's happening on her rainy afternoon. Thanks Cedric and hello, welcome back everyone. We have just been bumbling about, we did go past Twin Dams but nothing happening there. Two blacksmith lapwings and an Egyptian goose were coming out uh, and standing around the dam. So we carried on and my eyes are open. They are well peeled and we're having a look to see what we can find. There's a little um, Natal spur fowl in the road. I'm hoping it doesn't run away. Oh, it's gonna move. And I can just imagine with the rain stopped now, all these animals are like, is it true? Is it really stopped? Can I come out and say hello? You can see that really orange beak and bright orange legs as well. Now there are two other birds that look very similar to this one that we see very often running in the road. The one is a Swanson Spurfowl and the other is a Crested Franklin. And the difference between this and the Swanson Spurfowl is the Swanson Spurfowl has sort of a red um, patch on its face and a little bit on its neck so that's very distinctive difference between this one and that one. And then the Crested Franklin has a uh, I think a very different um, coloration with its feathers, a bit more streaky, but also the big thing with a crested Franklin, of course it has a crest on its head, but it has a tail that flicks upwards. Both the Natal Spurfowl and the Swanson Spurfowl actually have um, no real tail, well they have a little tail, but it stays down, tucked underneath at the back. Whereas with the Crested Franklin, you often see that flicked up tail, which is very different from the other two. And it makes for a quick, easy ID if you need to know which one it is on the go. You can just see this little spur fowl has tucked its neck away in between its shoulders, trying to trap in as much warm air as it can. looks like a little poof ball actually oh 
Oh, Greg, you would like to know how many eggs they lay at a time and if it's similar to a chicken. So, no. Um, as far as I know, the chickens lay an egg, uh, one egg a day, if I'm not mistaken. Whereas these spur fowls will have what we call a little clutch of eggs. I think I've seen, oh, maybe four, five, even six little chicks at a time could even be more i mean they could lay maybe eight to ten um eggs but at the end of the day only so many survive so they sort of have a few um together at once and they usually uh breed around we see a lot of them towards the end of the year with their chicks around and now i've actually seen quite a few um you can see that they're younger by their size so they've grown up um they've sort of fledged as it were but they're still with their parents um or mom at least um but they're just a little miniature versions um particularly with the crest frank and i haven't seen that for the natal spur file this year just as yet but who knows we may be able to see some natal spur file chicks as well I am very impressed with how long the spurfile is staying in the road. I thought we were just going to have a brief glimpse. Oh, Yolanda, you want to know if they're related to guinea fowl? I'm not actually sure. I mean, in a sense, they are grouped together because they are what we refer to as ground dwelling birds. They're not necessarily um little songbirds or full-on um perching birds although they do roost in trees they'll fly up and roost in trees and they do have uh, a back claw as part of their foot structure which means that they can hold onto branches but they spend majority of the day on the ground um foraging and looking for for little things to eat but um for the most part they they are um, on the ground, as I said earlier. But guinea fowl, similar foot structure, a little bit larger, um, and they may very well have some connections. But guinea fowl are a lot larger bird. They, of course, have a completely different coat uh, or coat of feather as well. But so lovely to just see this Franklin trying to dry off, I think, a little bit. Cheetahs and other animals, so good to hear from you. You say you are loving this birding activity. Well, thank you so much. At the moment, it's all I'm able to find. Uh, so we're making the most of the little bits of birding that does come out there have also been quite a few starlings around they're just in the tree sort of in the distance behind this spur file but they might I think they're a little bit too far to get a good look at also there's very dark skies around at the moment so anything up in a tree is quite difficult to be able to put on camera for you all with the light being what it is But I think we are going to leave this Franklin B, I mean this profile B, and um, carry on with our bumble up ahead. And we're really on the lookout for anything at the moment, anything of interest. It has, the, the rain has held off for a significant amount of time now, so I wouldn't be surprised if we do see one or two more of the mammals coming out, even birds starting to perch out on branches, um, maybe trying to dry off a little bit. Um, let There's not much heat around, but at least let the wind blow and maybe dry off those feathers a little bit more. Well, I think we are going to start up and then carry on forward. We'll have to ask this 
spur file to excuse us. But it'll be fine. They'll just move off and then they are free to come right back. Oh, off it goes. If it chooses to. I'm just passing a little pan here on the left. I'm just checking to see if there's anything else that we can spot. Now, earlier today at Buffelshook Dam, I was asked a question about crocodiles displaying um, or having some sort of courtship display when it comes to mating. And I did a little bit of checking up on exactly what happens there. So I wanted to get back to that question to let you all know. And apparently it's the males that display to the females. And they do quite a bit of showing off really. A lot of twisting, turning, tail flapping. Um, they also, sorry, we just got to mind the tree here as we go past. It is very wet, so we just have to be careful. Um, and then they put their heads under the water and um, start blowing a lot of bubbles as well, quite significantly to show the female that they're strong and fit and healthy. So I just wanted to update you all on male crocodiles courtship display to the female. Paul, we can have a look at this tree. Not. Oh, I'm so sorry. We've got the that I can't exactly show you too well. But we had a tree here that bark was all twisted off. Uh, left that male elephant uh, still here going down on the western side of Juma now. Just gonna go take a look. But uh, only good thing as well with the rain now, if we do find tracks and it's on top of the rain, wow, 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 then it's gonna be fresh. Then it's gonna be fresh. So, I am just waiting for that moment where I see a leopard track that's gonna be on top of the the rain that's fallen so you'll find a nice print or two or ten in the road and we can follow and then we're not going to be too far behind let's let's see yes at least the rain has subsided now it's disappeared for the time being touch wood I don't have any wood yet, I'll just touch that. There we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Krabus, uh, well. I can't show, like, I, I don't have any leopard tracks now. But if we get a leopard track, I'll show you.
We're going to come out towards Empire Plains now. It's, we had a nice family of warthogs here the other day. You see them, they might be slow around here, yeah, maybe out and about. Corin, you said you're birds of prey. Oh. Standing on. I think birds of prey are using most of, most of the time they'll actually use their eyesight. So they've got fantastic eyesight. If you look at something like a vulture, for instance, a uh, vulture will use their eyesight. So they will pretty much uh, hive, go very, very high, looking for any carcass that's uh, lying around in the area. Even the, <clears throat> even the impalas, everything is hiding away. That's kind of weather. It's uh, canine girl. Yeah, I think the Telemati breakaways are pretty much enjoying this area again. You know, the, the area that they are used to. I think they had to take a little bit of time out and go a little bit further west and um, even gone further north and all that but uh, you know where they are now again they are used this is where the, the, the two youngsters were brought up the older female as well she knows the area like off by heart so yes they, i think they feel feel safe here i think they feel very safe on this uh, in this area so won't be surprised if we, <clears throat> if we get to see them coming south again very soon I think there is going to be a lot of pressure a little bit further north. I don't know, I'm trying to think which males. I know I've got the Red Road male that side. Uh, I've got other prides like the Mambiri pride. You've got the Naru pride, all in the northern areas there, towards uh, Manialeti, Bifelsuk boundary, those areas. So, yeah, you've got a few prides that side. So, I think they will feel quite safe just to come back south again. And I'm hoping that we do get to see them coming on to Juma very shortly but we had a fantastic two days with them fantastic it's lovely really been spoiled there find out thing let's go try do monkey orange oh, oh. I think monkey, yeah, I'm gonna go. There's another little road here called Monkey Orange. Just gonna give it a go. Not many people use that road. It's almost like a road less traveled. And we've been very, very fortunate having a few great sightings there with uh, Shadulu, that beautiful leopardess. And Tortoise Pan comes on there as well, maybe even Nene. So, oh, well, let's go give that one a go. I don't think it'll. <coughs> This kind of thing, I don't think a leopard wants to lie in the grass, this wet grass. Uh, maybe a tree will be a little bit more comfortable. Um, a little bit easier for a leopard, so... Let's see if we can get one up in a tree somewhere. Ooh. Ooh, a 
it looks like a bark spider. Where was the oh it's going down there? What's oh, what is it's a bark spider. Oh hey, look at that. Ooh That's a big spider. Is it a bark yeah it's a bark spider, I can see the big abdomen. Oh and then what they'll do, start spinning their webs now. And then early morning, early morning they will start uh, actually devouring their own web again and use it again for the next late afternoon. Look at that, it's busy spinning. That is amazing. And it's huge. I'm so glad it's uh, a meter away from me. <laughs> this is amazing. And catching at night time, catching all the insects. So it's just preparing its web. So it'll, what it's doing now, it's climbing right up and now it's got an anchor web that's pretty much dragged from one tree to the other tree. That's like more of a, a stronger a stronger web and then now it's using that anchor web as an anchor and now it's spinning the rest of the web from top to down, uh, to top to bottom and then of course from side to side. And then it's got a nice little web for the evening. They are beautiful. They are really stunning, but uh, <laughs> watch it. It's amazing how they walk across that anchor web. Quick, quick. And little deer, even a little raindrop on its abdomen there. And it's going down now again. And it'll do this every single day. Every day. I'm going to attach it to the grass stem. It's attaching it there now. And off it goes. Daphne K, it is amazing. This is amazing. <laughs> this, yeah, I'm like that. I've got such a phobia for spiders, but this is just so amazing to see how they are just uh, constructing its web for the night, making sure that it's nicely set up. So you've got all the moths and uh, flying ants, all the insects flying around tonight, hoping that it's going to catch something, some dinner. And, uh, and Panda is doing an amazing, amazing job just keeping the spider in focus and keeping it on screen. Oh, and I do apologize for that. Go down. There we go. Attach it to that branch. Yeah, full out. So I'm also glad I've I've had one of these spiders. Luckily, not on me, but on a guest. So it was across the road from one tree to the other tree at night time, and while we were returning back to the lodge. Um, this big spider, one of these ones, like just as big as this one, it was, it was huge. And unfortunately I didn't, didn't see it and uh, the vehicle aerial broke the anchor web and the spider came flying past, uh, flying past me and it landed on a, a guest sitting right at the back. And uh, yeah, no, we, we, knew, we knew all about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would have done the same. I would have been singing a Celine, Di a Celine Dion song if that thing had to fall on me. I would have been sounding like I think my notes would have been just as high. <laughs> and it goes down again. 
Yeah, Forest Monarch. It looks like it is like a zip lining across, all across, just trying to get those webs going. And they've got quite a nice pattern. You won't be able to see it now, unfortunately, because of the light and everything. But uh, the pattern of the webs is also quite, uh, quite remarkable. Really a fine art at this. Imagine just doing this every single day and getting those that perfect pattern, that just that perfect uh, how can I say spacing between your webs. It looks like that's kind of almost a center point there where it was earlier. Attaching everything there, see there? Looks like almost like a center point there where it's pretty much attaching all the the webs to that and it's using that one as the one to go back and forth going down going up can you see the little spinneret there as well So amazing the, the the legs got that yellow and the black. I never knew they actually had that color legs. I thought it was just really uh, one like one color. What amazing patterns on them. You can actually see the webs on the side, eh? On the left and the right, you can actually see the spacing. Wow! Brilliant stuff. Like zip lining down now. Enjoy the spider, Cedric. Very cool find there. We came up to Gauri Dam, quite a big water hole that's very close to our camp, actually. And there were reports of a giraffe that was seen around there, so we tried to find it, but unfortunately, we were not able to see it again. Uh, so, right now, we are just carrying on down the road, doing a little bit of a loop actually, um, and seeing what we can find. There may be a slight breakup in picture here, everyone. We're just going through a dip. But I'm going to try to get out of it as quickly as possible. <clears throat> All right, there's a few bumps here. Hang on. And we should be good again. It's also an interesting feeling. I can't really describe it to you. <laughs> Luanda says he's hanging on tight. Um, the sort of eeriness in the in the air there are these very dark clouds around and um, the rain's held up for now but there may be more coming it feels like there is at the moment So we'll have to see what the night brings after we finish up the show and for tomorrow morning. It did look like the sun was going to shine again tomorrow, so fingers crossed it would be nice to just dry out a little bit.
And it's also that time of day, now that the rain has stopped, that we may actually see something exciting. The moon. The moon. There, everyone, there we can see the moon on the right. But um, we're just trying to find an angle to show you all that will mean I'm not actually sure. Do I need to go to the side? <laughs> oh, we are in infrared as well. No, it's okay, poor. If it's going to be, unfortunately, with a rain roof, everyone, it does limit our view a little bit in terms of being able to get a picture for you. And Paul sits a little bit, actually quite a lot higher up than I do. Um, and sometimes what I can see is not always what he's able to see. But I'll describe it to you. Basically, there's a little parting in the clouds. And the moon is sort of coming through and it's quite hazy. So it was just nice to be able to see the moon or... If, if it was the sun earlier, then it would have been nice to see the sun. We haven't seen it for most of the day. Mm. But I was saying just now that this time of day, with the rain having pretty much completely stopped, and um, it hasn't sort of come back again since about, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour ago. Um, we could maybe catch something in the last little bit of the show coming out onto the road. Ooh, Geo, you want to know if the phases of the moon affect the animals coming out at night? Um, yes, there are. There is an effect that happens when it is more, um, when more of the moon is showing, closer to full moon, the brighter it is out um, in the bush. And actually, sometimes it's even been recorded that cheetah have hunted at night when it is full moon because there's so much light around that it's almost as good as hunting with sunlight. And for predators in general, they may be more active with full moon around uh, just because there is so much more light. And even though they adapted to, with the special eyes, you know, with um, special lucidium layers and things like that, that reflect extra light within the eye so that they can see at night, which is what lions and leopards have. Um, they are even, they can see even more when the sun, when the, when the moon is in full. So when it's something like new moon, when the moon is completely dark, um, it's not reflecting any of the sun's light, then it's a lot darker and actually let's maybe say that prey species have less to worry about in a way. Um, although with nocturnal animals, they of course adapted to the night time. So we can't really say that uh, it's not like they only hunt when it's full moon. But perhaps animals that are more inclined to daytime hunting or hunting in natural light would be able to take advantage of the full moon and therefore actually there's more animals that are at risk at that time. So that's sort of the behavior uh, influence that I would uh, take from that geo. I'm not quite ready to get out my spotlight just yet, actually. I personally really enjoy driving at dusk. Uh, once sort of the sun has set, but there's still a little natural light around. So we'll see, eventually I will have to get it out, but maybe before the end of the show, maybe not, we'll see. 
I can actually still see pretty well right now. And if there was something in the road up ahead of us, I would be able to see it without the use of a, of a spotlight at the moment. We are heading now towards quite a big open area. And what I like about that at this time of the day is that if there is anything out and about, we could easily see it. So we're just gonna do a little circle there, see if there's anything that we can find. A last minute leopard would be nice. If I was asking, that is what I would ask for. Ooh, Scarlet! You are saying maybe we'll get lucky with a last minute chameleon. I don't know when last I actually saw a chameleon. I think about a month ago or so when I actually went out and looked for one. I mean they're pretty tricky to find if you're not looking and at night what we're looking for is on bushes and, and small trees, or maybe sometimes big trees as well, next to the road, they like to come and sleep on the end of little branches. And that's when we're able to spot them. So we can sometimes see them with the naked eye. Sometimes if you're using a spotlight when it's quite dark already, their little bodies shine out um, quite almost a, a lime green in comparison to the darker tree that they're in. So when your eye gets into it, you can sometimes quite easily begin to spot the chameleons. But that's a good one, Scarlett. And for the, the time that I'm here, I'm going to try and find you a chameleon. But we can only look for them in that way at night time once it's completely dark. Um, in the day, they are active. Oh, I didn't catch name there. Uh, something, something lover. Um, you want to know if there are any animals that are attracted to spotlights? Meerkat lover, there we go. Um, yeah, there's a lot of bugs that are attracted to <laughs> to to a spotlight um i don't know about mammals or birds I'm just thinking as far as i know particularly uh, moths beetles that sort of thing i uh, love to fly towards a spotlight and in the peak of summer I mean, when I was here in October last year, which is just the beginning of summer actually, but once you get that first heat wave and the heat comes in and all the sort of different factors um, adjust to correctly hatch the larvae and eggs that are underground or wherever the beetles have laid them, um, or the moths or things like that, then there's almost, almost a boom of insects. And I remember then being absolutely hammered by bugs <laughs> and I can tell you that a dung beetle to the face is painful Coming up to a nice big open clearing here, just towards our camp. Just taking a look, maybe we have missed out on something around here. A very pleasant uh, drive this afternoon. I think it was a little bit uh, challenging with uh, the rain that we've had. But that's alright, always nice just to enjoy a little bit of the rain and uh, still just being out here in nature always lovely and it's always tomorrow morning 
new day, a new dawn. Yeah. Well, this shows you how quickly the <clears throat> the night is uh, pretty much falling on on us now, as we're slowly heading into winter. Not completely yet, but we're slowly heading into that way. So of course our days are becoming way shorter, and our nights are getting a little bit longer. And now the nocturnal, now the nocturnal animals, now the nocturnal animals will come out. That's one thing about this summer, we don't see so many chameleons. Juliet, uh, you're most welcome. That spider, that uh, bark spider was fantastic. It was lovely. Even afterwards, uh, uh, Panda and myself, we were like, wow. Don't get to see that every, every day. And just the precision of that uh, bark spider on uh, building that web. It's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. I'm just seeing eyes there. Yeah. You see where I'm pointing, Panda? And we just want to see what's there. There's eyes there. Oh, you can actually hear it. It's a, it's a fiery neck night jar. You can see it there. Yeah. See it in the distance. You see a little white speckle there. Oh, there it goes. Uh, it's, a, it's a fiery, fiery neck night jar catching the insects and nocturnal birds. So it's going. <whistles> right, almost at camp. Almost at camp. Beautiful evening. I uh, just thought I saw maybe a frog or something I looked against here. Yeah? No, it's not. It's just a dead leaf. <laughs> I thought it was a frog. Rosemary, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Yeah, it was nice and it was a lot of fun. A lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, interesting moments with uh, the drizzle that came through and getting all our rain gear ready. And uh, but that's how it goes in the bush. Uh, that's how it goes. Didn't expect that much rain. All of a sudden, it came down uh, properly. Well, tomorrow is uh, Feline Friday, so hopefully it'll start off uh, with some nice uh, cat action tomorrow morning. I don't know. You know, we are in need of a, a leopard known as a Tlalamba. I think uh, I think she needs to show face tomorrow morning. What do you think, Panda? Yeah, I think 
so. No, I don't think so. I'm gonna tell you to get ready with makeup. <laughs> so Panda, <laughs> yeah, Panda, yeah. We'll, we'll make sure that she gets ready with her makeup tomorrow morning, so at least we can uh, see her. Yeah. I haven't seen her. We haven't seen her for a while. All right, well, we're just going to look one more time over here at the open clearing. Let's head over to Amy. All right, everybody, we are here around this open area. Uh, I've got my spotlight out, so I've just been checking the trees. We also switched on all of Wendy's lights, so we are well illuminated for anything that may come out this evening. We definitely won't miss it, that's for sure. I'm also keeping an eye out for that chameleon scarlet. But it does take a bit of concentrating. <laughs> ah, just to have a look properly and make sure that we don't miss a little a little friend. Darkman lover, thank you so much. Uh, really, it is great to hear from you. You are always so appreciative of what we do. So we're very grateful that you love our work and that you enjoyed the afternoon safari. It was a wonderful bumble and we actually had a fantastic time, really. I know that for the most part, there was a lot of rain, but we made the most of it, didn't we? And we actually ended up seeing some cool things. My highlight, without a shadow of a doubt, was that male rhino. Oh my word, I was like freaking out when we saw it. But anyway, everyone, we will be back with you tomorrow morning, the same time, same place at 6 a.m. Central African time. So please do make sure that you join us. And from myself and the team, we wish you a lovely evening further. Goodbye.